I just want to talk to him. Wait, why do you have a shotgun? I just want to talk to him. Dad, this is ridiculous. I just want to talk to him. I just want to talk to him. I just want to talk to him. I just want to shoot him. I just want to talk to him. You can't shoot him. Wait, what? What are you doing? All right, we should be live. Nathan Bennett, episode 21. If the podcast was a kid, it could now legally drink. Um, these episodes are recorded over at twitch.tv slash easygingy, as always, for you audio listeners or people watching on YouTube. Up in the top right for you video watchers, as always, we got the follower goal. We are on 37 out of 50 that we're trying to hit by the end of the year. So go follow that. These are recorded live over there. Twitch.tv slash EasyGingy in the description if you're watching on YouTube. As well as these are available on audio version on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that stuff. And for you audio listeners, these are available with video over on YouTube. So go follow the YouTube. Go subscribe to the YouTube. All that good stuff. Um, all right. All the social media out of the way. It is just me for this episode just kind of hanging out and we're going to talk about some of the recent NBA news with trades and who are contenders, some records being broken like Luca the other night, all that good stuff. So let's just get straight into it. So first one I want to talk about, obviously probably the biggest one going around, is the Portland Trailblazers and the Clippers trade. And I know that it's kind of a meme to say this with a lot of trades, but I think this is the first, or not the first one, but the one that's more recent that this is actually true with. The Blazers got finessed, straight up. I know a lot of people, they see a trade that they think is crazy, and they're like, oh, this team got finessed, and it's just sort of like, the meme and funny thing to do to say this team got finessed but the Blazers really did sort of drop the ball here and we we really have to dive into it a lot more than surface level to see why that is obviously you can go in and say okay well the Blazers made this trade because of cap space you know they need cap space they're trying to get rid of some contracts maybe give them a little more salary to work with so that they can get a piece that they need but they just went about it in a bad way in my honest opinion because they got rid of norman powell and norman powell going to the clippers you know norman powell is tremendous for his catch and shoot He's got, I think, 43% uh, catch and shoot, and he's doing amazing from the three. So, obviously, right now, Kawhi and Paul George are out. So, Norman Powell is going to have to put a lot of the work on his shoulders um, this season currently. Excuse me. And I, I don't know how that's going to turn out, I'll be honest. Because Norman Powell is more of a shooting guard, obviously. And again, we just talked about he he is mainly a catch-and-shoot player, almost like Klay Thompson on the Warriors. But with when Kawhi and Paul George get back, Norman Powell is going to be that sort of shooter that they need. Because obviously Kawhi can, Kawhi can shoot. He has that monumental highlight play against the 76ers to get Toronto to the finals. Kawhi can shoot from the three when he wants to, but at the end of the day, him and Paul George are both big men. And so to have sort of a smaller player that can do what you need, it, it do I want to make this comparison? It's going to be a weird comparison, but it's, it's going to be sort of like Kevin Love on the Cavaliers when he was with LeBron, right? Because LeBron was the big man for the team. He was their number one scorer, obviously. And then Kevin Love was pushed to sort of the three, became the catch and shoot, you know, get open on the corner, we'll pass you the ball, you you drain a three. 
and that I see Norman Powell easily doing that. He's going to be the third option behind Kawhi and Paul George, and he has amazing catch and shoot. So I could easily see, you know, get behind the arc. We're going to pass you the ball. We're already going to have defenders on us, us being Kawhi and Paul George, and then we'll set you up for a three uh, by getting you open by drawing the defenders on us. And then speaking of defenders, we then have to look at Robert Covington as well as in this trade. Blazers lose Robert Covington. That is a massive drop in defense for them. Obviously, Norman Powell, big drop in offense. You know, role players that the Blazers had dropping 30 points a game. A shooting guard right behind Dame and uh, playing a role somewhere to see Jay McCollum for them. But also, Robert Covington, the Blazers already didn't have that much height on their team. Robert Covington was only 6'7", and then they traded for... Oh, I completely just forgot his name. I'm sorry. I don't know why his name just skipped my mind, but y'all y'all know the trade. Um, is 6'6". Here, let me see if I can pull it back up. Let me Let me pull up the trade so I don't mess up th the names uh, sorry it's a little silent right now this is all going to be cut out of the um is it justice winslow yeah Yeah, Justice Winslow. So, that's who I was thinking of. So, you trade Robert Covington for Eric Bledsoe and uh, Justice Winslow. Robert Covington already playing a big man position for you, even though he's only 6'7", compared to other people in the league, such as, you know, Giannis, Jokic, um, even though Jokic is playing the center. And, but... The league, I've been talking about this a little bit in other videos, the league has been getting taller and taller the past couple years. The Blazers don't already didn't have that much height to begin with. And Robert Covington was 6'7". Then you not only don't add more height, you also go down. You lose an inch in Justice Winslow, and Robert Covington was leading your team in every single defensive stat. Robert Covington was leading your team in blocks with, I think, 1.5 blocks per game. Robert Covington was also leading your team in steals, despite being your quote-unquote big man on, on the Blazers. He's also leading you in total rebounds per game. And then you just trade him away. And now you have a smaller... You have, you, again, I'm sort of repeating myself, but you're losing height. And Justice Winslow, you know, was literally just talking about how he thought the Clippers were a fa uh, his family, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. Um, sorry, I got like 10 different thoughts about this trade going on, and I'm just trying to get them all out. Not to mention that Robert Covington uh, was acquired for the Blazers by trading two first rounds. And the Blazers basically just got scraps back. You know, they got Eric Bledsoe, who is decent. Um, they got Winslow, again, not that big uh, height-wise. And I don't know how... I can look at his stats right now. I don't know how good Winslow is in terms of defense but let's let's compare that real quick so justice winslow right now is only averaging 0.5 blocks per game we go to robert covington robert covington is averaging 1.3 so almost three times as many blocks per games because winslow is not even averaging is barely averaging half a block per game. Then we go to steals. 
So steals, again, you would expect more of your point guard, shooting guard to get steals because of height. But Robert Covington is averaging 1.5 steals per game right now. We go to Justice Winslow. Justice Winslow, again, much like the steals, only 0.6. So once again, Covington is averaging almost three times in that stat. Then, we go to total rebounds. Winslow is not even averaging 5 rebounds a game. Winslow is averaging 3.6 rebounds per game. And we go to Covington. Covington is averaging 5.7. And this isn't even for this season either. This is sort of the, the standard, the expectation. We can go to the 2020, uh, 2020 to 2021 season. 2021, Covington was averaging 6.7 rebounds. We go to Winslow. Winslow, 4.5. We go to Covington for steals. Steals is 1.4 for Covington. Steals for Winslow, 0 0.6 again. Blocks for 2020 to 2021 for Robert Covington, 1.2. Winslow, 0 0.5 again. So, I've been talking about in other videos, you know, the importance of defense being on the rise. We've seen a shift. I'm, I'm sorry if y'all hear the, the chair squeaking, you know. I don't have a massive... Ec great studio i'm recording in i'm just recording in my room so just got a office depot chair um but back on topic sorry just wanted to point that out in case y'all hear it creaking in the background whenever i'm moving around we the blazers explicit drop in defense here and they're gonna need that defense and i i I don't know what else to say besides that. We just went through the stats. You're seeing a drop in height, and to get Robert Covington, you had to give away two first-round picks as well. So now those first-round picks are gone, and all you have is a second-round pick. You know, if you're wanting to do a rebuild, because that's honestly what you should be doing, because you're making this trade to get cap space, you just basically gave, a, gave away your first two your two first rounders and then we can go to the clippers side of it the clippers uh again finesse the blazers got norman powell excellent catch and shoot gonna be an amazing third option that the clippers need when Kawhi and paul george come back and what i'm worried about is no, let's not even look at the stats, right? Something I've talked about many times on this channel, and people think, you know, I'm crazy for talking about this. They don't, A lot of people, I bring it up as important, and a lot of people just skip past it. Team chemistry. I've talked many times on this channel about team chemistry. Talked about how many times, it again, it's ignored, pushed under the rug, and every time I talk about it, people say it's not as important as I make it seem. But I really do think team chemistry is important. You know, how you can work off your teammates and how you view them uh, on and off the court will affect how your team performs. Justice Winslow, literally like a week ago, said, I feel like L.A. is my home, my family. And then now he's going to the Blazers. He's going to feel... And maybe I'm over-exaggerating this, but he's going to feel some t sort of loss there from leaving L.A. If he's true in saying that L.A. is his home. Then we go to Damian Lillard. Now, this is the obvious one. Damian Lillard is going, it has been saying, you know, Portland does not have the pieces right now. And everybody knows that. Damian Lillard didn't have to come out and say that. We we knew that. So then you go and you trade Robert Covington and Norman Powell. 
Now, I don't want to get into, you know, how will this affect how, like, if Dame asks for a trade or anything like that, because that's too speculative. And we simply don't know because Dame did resign with the Blazers despite everybody telling him to ask for a trade. And, you know, this could be the last straw for him, but we don't know what Dame's thinking, so I'm not going to get too much into it. But I will say that whether it be consciously or unconsciously, I feel like there is sort of going to be this weird tension between Damian Lillard and Eric Bledsoe and Justin Winslow that th just came through with this trade because Dame's already talking about, you know, the Blazers not having the right pieces. So then now he has to get in a locker room with Eric Bledsoe and Justin Winslow and be like, these are the guys that we traded Norman away for. And I don't want to talk about uh, past stuff too much. But I brought up the Netflix documentary Malice at the Palace a lot. And I honestly need to stop doing that because I bring it up a lot. But it's an amazing documentary. If you haven't seen it already, go check it out. Uh, Malice at the Palace documentary on Netflix. But Jermaine O'Neal talks about him joining the Pacers and him being disliked right off the bat. Saying, you know, this is who we traded for. And... I think it's it's sort of the same reaction in 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 Portland right now. Just you know, this is the guy we traded for. And that's all I have to really say on that. Um we talked about the Clippers getting Norman Powell, talked about Blazers. And then obviously the next trade on here. Not a confirmed trade, but the massive rumor going around right now. Harden for Philly. Now, I don't know if this is a hot take, but whether or not it's a hot take, I fully believe this would be a decent trade. I think, honestly, if Harden was traded for Ben Simmons, as much as Ben Simmons is seen as a bitch right now, it would be a really good trade for both the Nets and Philly to make. And let me start out by saying why it would be good for the Nets because a lot of people obviously don't like Ben Simmons right now they think why would anybody trade for Ben Simmons Ben Simmons is a garbage player because of how much he cries and you know everybody remembers that shot that was missed on Trey that could have changed the entire perspective of the 76ers franchise but there is one thing that you cannot take away from Ben Simmons and that is his defense Ben Simmons, in his past, I don't know how many seasons, has been in the Defensive Player of the Year ladder. And it's well-deserved. Let's Just like we did for Winslow and Covington, let's go to Ben Simmons' stats real quick. Because Ben Simmons, despite being a point guard, is 6'11". You know, Ben Simmons literally is like, here, let's look up Giannis height real quick because I don't know his exact height. I'm pretty sure he's, yeah, he's literally the same height as Giannis, according to Google, that is. So Google could be lying to me here, but let's go to Ben Simmons stats. So Ben Simmons, despite being a point guard, is averaging about one block per game, which isn't crazy, but again, he's not playing the big men position. He's not playing power forward or center, despite his size. But even though he's 6'11", he's playing the point guard position, and so he's getting also about two steals per game and then we go to his rebounds and he's getting about eight rebounds per game and i'm talking uh, by the way if i'm saying you know about one block 
about two steal. That's for his career. If we want to look at just last season, since he hasn't played this season, last season, 0.6 blocks, 1.6 steal, 7.2 rebounds. But as for career, career, 0.7 uh, bl uh, blocks with his um, 17 to 18 season having 0.9 blocks per game. And then career, 1.7 steals, 8.1 rebounds. So Ben Simmons has defense. And then if we go to the Nets roster, the Nets obviously are an incredible powerhouse when it comes to offense. But if we look at the highest blocks per game, Their highest blocks per game is by LaMarcus Aldridge, who only plays about 22 minutes per game. And then for steals, we have James Harden and then Kyrie Irving. Total rebounds, also James Harden. But James Harden is also having 4.8 turnovers and the nets are i don't know where their position is on but i can look it up real quick sorry i don't have these stats on hand they they have a lot of points for, uh per turnover and that is because of james harden Hang on, I'm trying to find it. Uh, opponent points per turnover. Brooklyn Nets have the fourth most points per turnover. Behind the Jazz, the Kings, and the Rockets. Now, the Sacramento Kings, despite being one of the worst teams... I'm sorry, Sacramento fans. Despite being one of the worst teams in the NBA right now, beat the Nets. And that's because KD's out and Harden's not playing like himself. Harden would add a decent shooter to Philly. You know, with Ben Simmons out, everybody's talking about Joel Embiid needs help. You're wasting Joel Embiid's prime, all that. James Harden would add a decent shooter to Philly. I think that's just obvious. I don't think I really need to go into depth on that. James Harden is a fantastic three-point shooter. And despite being, you know, shooting guard technically... He could be that that main smaller ball component that they thought they had in Ben Simmons. And then take Ben Simmons, put him on the Nets. The Nets really need defense right now. The Nets are outscoring everybody. The Nets, I that should be obvious. The Nets are an absolute powerhouse with their big three, scoring-wise. And KD... In my honest opinion, I think most people would agree Kevin Durant is the best scorer in the league right now. However, the Nets, in my opinion, have one of the worst defenses because of the amount of chips that they have put on the table in regards to offense. And... Whether you like it or not, Nets fans, I may seem like a Bucks bandwagon saying this. The Nets don't have the pieces to stop Giannis. The Nets can keep up with Giannis' scoring with KD. We saw that in the playoffs. KD can keep up with Giannis scoring-wise. However, you can keep up with him scoring... You cannot block him. 
you just you can't block Giannis on Sakumbo. Ben Simmons is the same height as Giannis on Sakumbo. Now, again, with what we saw in the playoffs with the 76ers, I don't think Ben Simmons is going to give you the same sort of scoring that James Harden may give you right now. But defense, defense, defense. And I I keep repeating myself, and I apologize for that. The Nets need to add more defensive pieces if they're going to win anything soon. Because Kevin Durant is the only person that is staying long-term with the Nets. And they need to figure something out, especially for this season. Because... Harden is talking about leaving. That's why we're bringing up this trade in the first place. Kyrie also has his contract that is ending and is not playing home games. And every single person pretty much has their contract ending this year or next year. And Kevin Durant is the only five-year contract. And we can go back to that Jarrett Allen trade. Um, I'll, I'll save that for a future video, but I'll talk about it a little bit. You know, they put in all their assets to get James Harden. And now James Harden says he doesn't want to be in Brooklyn anymore. Um, he didn't say exactly that, but you know, the put two and two together, he's hinting towards that. And obviously he can't explicitly say that because then that's considered quote-unquote tampering and all that, and that's another discussion for later. But Harden doesn't want to be in Brooklyn. Kyrie can't play home games, considering leaving Brooklyn probably as well for vaccine status. You put all of your eggs in one basket to win either last year or this year. So you have to do something. And Philly obviously needs to get rid of Ben Simmons. And I think it's a mutually beneficial trade for Harden for Ben Simmons. Especially, again, defense. And they traded away Jared Allen to get James Harden. And Jared Allen, I made a whole video on the Cleveland Cavaliers how they are doing so great because of their defense. You could have already had that defense in Jared Allen. But that's all I really have on that trade without repeating myself. I could go on for forever, but it would just basically the, be, be the same thing over and over. Talking about the added defense to the Nets and the, uh, yeah, just added defense to the Nets basically. As well as obviously Philly getting somebody that can role play off of Joel Embiid. As for other trades, I don't see Russell Westbrook getting traded uh, before the trade deadline. I think it would have been interesting to see him get traded to see where he goes, but I think the Lakers are just going to kind of hold on to him. Uh, I think the Lakers, um, I won't go too much into the Lakers right now, but I think the Lakers could make the play-in. They're not could. They are going to make the play-in. They are at that level. In regards to playoff spot, I don't know if they'll make a playoff spot. And if they do, I could see them being a first-round exit. I really don't think the Lakers are going to get that far this season. And I know speaking bad about the Lakers, you know, the I don't know what the exact percentages are, but, you know, just for a meme amount, 99% of NBA fans are also Lakers fans, you know. So anytime you talk battle about the Lakers, it's seen as a cardinal sin for NBA fans. But nowadays, most people would agree, the Lakers just simply aren't doing that great. And then, so that brings me to my next thing, though, which I have, which is who are the contenders this season? So we already talked about the Nets a little bit. The Nets need to figure out what they're going to do if KD gets injured, and they need to fix Harden's turnovers. Uh, Harden, we just talked about Harden getting massive amounts of turnovers, and regardless of whether or not they make the trade, 
this is something I forgot to mention in the trade talk. Har- uh, Harden is sort of like Ben Simmons right now in regards to even if you're not trading him, he is mentally out. Like, I would say whether or not you trade him, like whether or not he's off your team or not, he is mentally off your team. He does not want to be in Brooklyn. He is not going to put in the same 100% per game that he would if he liked Brooklyn. And we're seeing him not perform as good as he has in previous seasons and getting massive turnovers. So Brooklyn is just going to have to figure out a way to fix that with James Harden. And I feel like if Brooklyn wants to win this year, they're going to have to strategically lose. And what I mean by that is home court advantage. Usually home court advantage would be a good thing. You know, you want to play on your home court. Except Kyrie can't play home games. So if you have more games at home, that's more games that you don't have your full team. And then that gets basically back into the whole 2021 Bucks nets debate. You know, if the Nets would have been healthy, would they have won and all that. You don't want to effectively put a quote-unquote injury on Kyrie, because he's not really injured, but for comparison, put an injury on Kyrie because you won too much, if that makes sense. You want to strategically lose to not have home court advantage so that you can have Kyrie for more games to progress through the playoffs. And how they're going to do that, I don't know. But having Kyrie not there for home games, you want him there, obviously, more than not being there. So then that gets into the Bucks. If the Bucks play the Nets, we just talked about the Bu- the Nets don't really have anybody to stop Giannis. And many people don't really have anybody to stop Giannis. The Bucks have had some injuries at the beginning of the season. However, they are the reigning champs. I think that Middleton has gotten a little bit more consistent since last year. That has been his massive criticism is Middleton is simply not consistent. And I feel like he has got more consistent, but I guess we'll see what happens when it actually does become playoff time. But Middleton... Giannis and Drew personally are a big three for the Bucks, And I like Drew's defensive game, you know, not even talking about Giannis right now. Let's take Giannis out of the picture. Drew Holiday has an amazing defensive game. That play in the finals against the Suns, even without the alley-oop to Giannis, is a highlight play. Because it's the final moments of the game, you need to either block the shot or get the ball with the game that close. I forget the exact score, but it was a couple seconds left, and I think it was like 102 to 100 or something. So the Suns easily could have gone for a three or something and and won. But instead, Drew Holiday gets the steal alley-oops it to Giannis. Giannis uh, secures either a four or a six-point lead. Something like that. I don't remember the exact score again, but it was a close game, to say the least. So, Drew Holiday's defense, and then you add Giannis there. Giannis up for Defensive Player of the Year, as well as MVP. Giannis is getting triple-doubles every night with rebounds, assists, and points. And then he also has his obvious blocks with his size. And he's even getting steals. And we can go into Giannis's basketball IQ. Giannis being the first option for his team. He has incredible basketball IQ. He's having no-look passes that are blown up all over Instagram. He knows how to pass the ball now. But even with the Giannis and Drew Holiday defense... 
we have to talk about the loss of P.J. Tucker. With the loss of P.J. Tucker, they do lose that defense that was crucial for them because, again, defense is becoming more important. And with the Nets scoring that we just talked about, the Nets are outscoring everybody, and they need an answer or, uh, an answer for the Nets. And P.J. Tucker kind of helped provide that. Well, now we have P.J. Tucker gone. We still have Brooke Lopez, but we're using a little bit more of Bobby Portis. I really like Bobby Portis. I was kind of scared when they said they weren't going to re-sign Bobby Portis because I think Bobby Portis really does add a lot to the Bucks. It adds sort of a depth to their bench if Giannis isn't playing. We saw Giannis injured and Bobby Portis was playing. And I think Bobby Portis honestly did a really good job. And that's why I want to keep him because he adds a depth in that power forward position. And I've also talked about even having him not on the bench at all. I personally like the idea of getting rid of Brooke Lopez and having Giannis at the center and Bobby Portis in that power forward position. But that's a discussion for another day. Then we go to... I'm going to take a sip of my drink real quick. My mouth's getting a little dry, so excuse me real quick. So P.J. Tucker, no longer on the Bucks. We just talked about how that affects the Bucks. But what team does he go to? The Miami Heat. The Miami Heat now have this defensive power in P.J. Tucker, along with Bam Adebayo. There was a tweet by SportsCenter, and I don't know what the records were, but it showed the records without each of their starters. And the starters have not played that many games together, with Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo being injured, and all these other things. But... This is the huge controversy that's sort of been going around the NBA right now. Uh, is about the Miami Heat. And, you know, they use that buzzword. Are they contender or are they pretender? I honestly think that the Miami Heat can go far in the playoffs. I do not think they will make the finals. I think that they will make the conference finals and lose I honestly think I talked about this a little bit on a previous episode I think we could easily see the spawn of a new rivalry in the NBA which is between the Bucks and the Heat because the Bucks and the Heat have faced each other for two years now the Bucks won the, or the Heat won the first one the Bucks won the second one and I could easily see them paired up again this third time and we'll have to see P.J. Tucker face the team he was just traded from. And I, I think it's going to be very exciting. But regardless, P.J. Tucker adds the defense to the Heat. Bam Bio adds defense to the Heat. Kyle Lowry becomes an extra shooter that they can utilize along Jimmy Butler. So now you have offense, o- more offensive power. And more defensive power. And the Heat were sort of a team that weren't looked at before this season. It's kind of a weird way to phrase that. But I I would say not many people looked at them to win the title this year. Especially after being swept by the Bucks. Then this year, they're second in standings. And I feel like that sort of pushes coaches and GMs and analyst and everything at all the executives or people involved with other franchises to look at the heat and say okay how do we find a strategy for the heat so the heat sort of were i'll say a dark horse and now with them winning they I feel like they're still sort of a dark horse for fans. We don't know where they're going to end up. But coaches, they're they're making strategies for the Heat now because they have to figure out a way to get around P.J. Tucker, a way to get around Bama Nabayo, 
and how to either outscore or defend Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry. And I think that that could easily push them to the conference finals and probably a conference finals against the Bucks. And I could I see the Bucks winning that. That may be my bias, but again, I I put my I I bet on Giannis in that. But we could see some PJ Tucker on Giannis, um, which again would be very exciting. Then we have the Bulls. The Bulls. Oop, sorry if y'all can hear that. I hope not. My computer just beeped at me for a second. So, the Bulls' biggest problem is going to be injuries. Because I didn't even bring up during the Bucks. Uh, the Bucks have added depth to their vents with Grayson Allen. And then you also have Pat, uh, Pat Connaughton and everything else. But speaking of Grayson Allen... The Bulls have had a big problem with injuries, uh, whether it be caused by somebody. I'm not going to get into a whole controversy of Grayson Allen, but in my opinion, even being a Bucks fan, the Grayson Allen play was dirty. Um, that's just another Zaza and Kawhi situation. But I'm not going to go for 10 minutes talking about the whole Grayson Allen thing. Regardless, a lot of the Bulls are injured right now. And DeMar DeRozan has uh, come back. Uh, won against, I think, the Pacers last night. And let's pull up his stats real quick. What did he score coming out of injury? Yeah, so the Bulls beat the Pacers 122 to 115. And despite not having Lonzo Ball or Caruso or Levine, they scored 122 because Vucevic scored 36 and had 17 rebounds. And DeMar DeRozan had 31 points and one block and one steal. So obviously, both having 30 point nights, massive offensive potential. And that's not even with Lonzo, Caruso, and Levine. I could easily see the Bulls taking it all this year. If they can stay healthy. Because I don't know when Levine is going to come back. I don't know when Lonzo is coming back. When Caruso is coming back. But if they had their full team. They're easily pushing that finals if not trophy. Their defense is there with Vucevic. And... Just the way that that team can play off of each other, despite being their first year all together, is just insane to me. And we all speculated that the Lonzo and DeMar trades were ridiculous, and then now they're performing the, the, the way that they are. And I can go... Let's look up the Bulls defensive rating real quick. While I'm looking the uh, the Bulls defensive rating up, the Heat I know are seventh um, in defensive rating. As well as having the least amount of points per the in the paint. I think it's 40. Here, I'll pull it up right now since I'm already pulling up the Bulls one. So Miami Heat. Only 39.7 points in the paint. Now, I know I'm sort of backtracking and I apologize. We just talked about Giannis not being able to 
no no team has an answer for Giannis. You know, you hear that all the time. And Giannis, any basketball fan can tell you Giannis is, is a powerhouse in the paint. Now, if we say that the Miami Heat have the least amount of points in the paint and are good defensively in the paint, then, again, we just have to see how those clash and say, okay, is the Miami Heat going to outpower Giannis or is Giannis going to overpower the Miami defense? And that'll be exciting to see with the Miami Heat, again, having the seventh best defensive rating. But the Chicago Bulls right now, not a great defensive rating. Um, but again, that could be because of injuries. You know, you screw up a couple games with not having your, your best players and you're going to drop. But regardless, the Bulls are still fourth uh, with the most wins in the NBA right now. And where are they in the East? I think they're second in the East. No, they're f first in the East, and the Heat are behind them. So, again, we're just going to have to see uh, where they end up. But I can look at the player stats for the Bulls real quick. And look at how many blocks each player has. So, blocks per game. Vucevic, healthy right now. Then you have Lonzo Ball right behind him. So Lonzo Ball, despite being a point guard, has the second most highest box on their team. Then we can go to steals. Caruso and Lonzo Ball, both highest in steals on the Bulls, with about two steals per game, but both out. Then again, despite being a point guard, Lonzo Ball is second in rebounds, behind Vucevic now Vucevic is healthy so they are still getting those rebounds again Vucevic the other night or not the other night last night had 13 rebounds and I think that could honestly be their one of their biggest key pieces is winning the rebound battle get more possessions um, the if you get more possessions you have more opportunity to score and that's just obvious. And the Bulls having such an amazing starting five like that, Vucevic, uh, DeRozan, Lonzo Ball, Caruso, um, you know, they're able to get assist everywhere. And having that assist potential and winning the rebound battle, it's just an easy ability to turn that into plays, playmaking, and the Bulls, again, I could easily see going to the finals if not winning that trophy. So then the last two that I have on here are the Suns and the Warriors. Now, the Suns and the Warriors, I have sort of the same perspective of, so I'm going to kind of blend them together. But the Suns and the Warriors are both top in the West right now. And so... They are going to be the matchup to watch in the West, obviously. The Suns are coming back from a lost finals appearance, and they want to prove that they can do it again and they can win this year. And the Warriors coming back wanting to prove that they can still be the Warriors after having so many injuries and everything. Klay Thompson coming back. Um... But the main thing I want to focus on is, again, defense. I know that's sort of the theme of this episode or theme of the podcast because I talk about defense a lot. But the Warriors and the Suns both are top of their conference because, or top of the Western Conference because they both have the highest defensive rating in the NBA. You have Chris Paul getting steals, Michael Bridges getting blocks. And then you have Draymond Green and uh, – I forgot his name. I'm, I, I apologize. But you have Draymond Green who's defensive uh, – who, who has repeatedly gotten defensive player of the year. And you have Chris Paul 
and uh, Michael Bridges. So, once again, let's just go to defensive rating. Golden State Warriors are above the Phoenix Suns. But the Phoenix Suns have jumped up and down with the Golden State Warriors a lot. So the Warriors right now are 103.5 and Phoenix Suns 105.4. And the Warriors are leading them in defensive rebounds, uh, leading them in steals, and we're leading them in blocks as well. However, the Phoenix Suns have the less amount of points per have, have the least in the NBA uh, a point, opponent points off turnovers and they lead the the Warriors lead the Suns by a large margin in opponent points second chances. And then if we go to points per uh, points in the paint, again with Draymond Green, the Warriors are right behind the Bucks, with the Bucks having the fourth and Warriors having the fifth least opponent points in the paint. So both teams again having massive uh, players on defense that they can rely on, but then we also have sort of the same skill set on offense as well. You know Steph Curry being able to shoot his three. He's sort of coming out of his slump now, which is exciting to see. So he'll definitely be ready uh, to go by playoffs, in my opinion, unless we see some crazy injury. Klay Thompson back, their catch-and-shoot player that they need. But then we go to the Suns. And the Suns are almost sort of that mirror of the Warriors. Which is weird to say, but I think if you look at their team, you'll be able to see it too. The war, the Warriors have Steph Curry that can shoot the three. The Suns have Chris Paul that can shoot the three. The Warriors have Draymond Green, who's a defensive player. The Suns have Bridges, who's a defensive player. The Suns have Booker, who's a catch and shoot. Uh, the Suns have Booker, who's a catch-and-shoot. The Warriors have Klay Thompson, who's a catch-and-shoot. I feel like no matter what, uh, what position or what role a player plays on the team, the other team has that exact same role player or player on their team in regards to the Suns Warriors. And so I honestly have no idea how that matchup would turn out. Because, again, I feel like the Suns and the Warriors are almost complete mirror images of each other. And I feel like each team has an answer for the other. And we've only... How many times have we seen the Warriors and Suns compete together this season? So the Warriors Suns according to this have played 3 times so far this season. So December 3rd, December 25th and November 30th. So November 30th the Suns won 104 to 96, but then the Warriors have won the last two. But Chris Paul is also been injured and I don't know if he was injured for when when was Chris Paul injured sorry <laughs> when did Chris Paul hurt his no not that one
Yeah, okay, well, I'm trying to find when he was injured, but all I can find is his injury during the playoffs. But regardless, Chris Paul was uh, injured this season, and so I wonder how that affected the December games with the Warriors winning. But regardless, um, again, the Suns-Warriors, I could see going any either way. They, they're they mirror images of each other, and each one has an answer for the other. And we're coming up on an hour here, and I have reached my topic list as well. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the Spurs, but there's nothing too crazy in regards to them. Jonte Murray still hasn't won, uh, beaten the triple-double record, so um, can't really talk about that. Uh, but Pop is six wins away from the win record, and DeJounte Murray does have the most um, double-doubles, um, I think, in a season. Let me go back to the tweet that I was looking at. So this is from at Airless Jordan. DeJounte Murray has 19 games this season with a point assist double double. More than Tony Parker or Mono Ginobili ever had in a season, and most by a Spurs player since Avery Johnson's 23 in 1995 to 1996. So DeJounte Murray, not much to say on that. Um, we already went into it. Um, multiple times already, DeJounte Murray's an all-star player, and he's just not getting what he deserves for the fact that he, the, the Spurs are not doing great this season. And I made a video going into should the Spurs tank, and Clan the Spurs fans talked about it. Pretty much every Spurs YouTuber, uh, content creator has t talked about should the Spurs tank or not. Um... But that's, I think that's all I have for this episode of the podcast. I know a lot of it was contenders and trades, but that's sort of what I did want to focus on for this episode. So uh, I will see you all in the next one, guys. Again, like I said at the beginning, catch these live over on Twitch. Uh, these are available in video version on YouTube. Uh, go follow the Instagram, Nathan Butnet, TikTok, Twitter, all that. It, if you look, if you look up Gingy or Nathan Butnett on any social media platform, you should be able to find it. And then these episodes are available in audio versions on Spotify, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, all that good stuff. And I think that is it for the socials and all that sort of stuff. So I will see y'all in the next one, guys. Nathan Butnett, episode twenty-one.